Slide seven is in front of us. Slide seven is in front of you. Six now. Okay. All right, let's seven. proceed. Yes. Slide six is in front of us. Let's proceed. Okay. All right, Jefferson. Slide six, I've explained it's about the, the magnitude of the problem. It covers the three areas the unauthorized expenditure, the fruitless and wasteful expenditure, and the irregular expenditure. And we've explained the numbers. Uh, slide seven, Chairperson, it begins to talk about the number of uh, service providers affected. In the main account, we have 198. In the water trading entity account, we have 364 uh, investigations. And then we have completed 126 in the main account, and we have concluded 70 in the water trading uh, NDT account. And uh, we still have 72 that have not been concluded in the main account, which is why we bring in more capacity to finalize the investigations. And then we still have about 294 on the water trading side, and that's 2.5 billion. We're just breaking down what we have presented in the previous slide, Chairperson. Uh, you also have investigations concluded, two investigations concluded uh, in the main account um, uh, to the tune of 17 million, and then we have seven instances on the water trading NTT account to the tune of 3,4 billion. And that's on this, on slide eight, Jefferson, I hope you can see slide eight. It's a, it's a pie chart. What we're trying to do here, Chair, is to give you a comprehensive picture of what we are dealing with here by category. You would notice that 33% uh, three, of the irregularities are happening with our implementing agencies, and these will be your water boards, these will be municipalities, uh, which is why the minister has zoomed into that space, the water board space, so that we can deal with all of these uh, irregularities. Mm -hmm. They're not only big in numbers, but they're also big in monetary terms. You can see all the categories on the right hand side where it says risks areas, uh, where it says three quotations not obtained, and there are about 43 instances where three quotations were not obtained, and this amounts to 33 million approval by non-delegated officials, 13 of those, and the amount is about 419 million. Conflict of interest is one. I'm not going to read all of them, Chair, but what this slide, slide eight, is trying to do is to give you a breakdown of all of these irregularities that we are dealing with in the main account. This slide is the water trading entity account. We're doing exactly the same thing. It says in the water trading entity account, the biggest area of risk is your sun repayment. And the majority of these sun repayments are below 500,000. And that's slide nine, Chair, that we're depicting now. Uh, but you will see that sun repayment, even though it's big in numbers, it's not necessarily big in terms of monetary values, uh, but you can see that uh, you've got a lot of sun payments, but they are not big in monetary value, but there are a lot of them. And these are instances of uh, quotes below um, uh, 500,000. Uh, you've got events there, events management, there's 19 of those. There's uh, the bid adjudication, having no quorum, DBEC, there's 19 of those, and the amount is about 214 um, million. You have deviations there, seven of those. The amount is about 901 million. Uh, Chair, you can see um, the sum repayments, even though it's 206, the value, the monetary value is 114 million. Slide 10, Chairperson, is just explaining the unauthorized expenditure. This happened, and it was stated in the 2018 um, financial year, 
uh, on budget eradication, we have 292 million. Uh, and then on overspending on war on leaks program, you have 348 million. And that gives you a total of about 641. And uh, I'll come back to consequence management that is linked to these particular misconducts. We have already started consequence management. You have officials that have been charged and uh, the, the disciplinary process is, is kicked in in some cases. Um, Chairperson, I'll come back to consequence management. Slide 11, it gives you a breakdown of fruitless and wasteful expenditure in numbers. That we have referred cases, 56 cases, that have been referred for uh, forensic investigations. You have uh, 56 cases that have been completed. And then you have uh, one case under the water trading entity account that uh, is still outstanding. Then you have 32 that have been completed under the water trading entity. And then you have uh, 33 that have been referred for further investigation. On a slide 12, Chairperson, we just picked the, what we call the big rocks, the big uh, challenges. Uh, these are big projects that uh, we have already processed for condonation. That is the nine billion rands that we have submitted to National Treasury for condonation. As you know, Chair, there will be no condonation without consequence management. You have to initiate consequence management in order for National Treasury to condone it. You can see the list of projects. It's your Guiana Water Services project, war on leaks, budget eradication. We've touched on it. The Tugela hot draw scheme, desalination plant in uh, Richards Bay, uh, the SAP ECC6 unlimited SAP license, information technology. I'm not going to read all of them, Chair. But I think DG it may be beneficial that. Uh, six beyond main account. I think it's beneficial that you speak to these condonations uh, here. It was a thing to just skirt the, over there. The material irregularities. It's not built. Okay. Chairperson, we are now on slide 14. And uh, on slide 14, we have started looking at some of the boards, including um, some of the municipalities, but we haven't touched on municipalities for now. We're just focusing on the boards. The Amatola Water Board not paid within 30 days, and this happened in 2018, and uh, we have an amount of about 12.7 million rents there, uh, which was disclosed in Note 25 of the financial statement. The biggest challenge here, Chairperson, is that the department, the organization, had financial challenges in that particular financial year, and they took forever to pay service providers. So there's a lot of money that was paid for standing time, uh, which was paid uh, beyond 30 days. And 30 days is a required uh, legislative period for paying and processing claims. On slide 15, here, this particular issue, Jefferson, which is a 17 million rents, we don't want to mention the name of the service provider because this matter is now uh, going to court. Uh, in fact, it's in court already, I'm told by my colleagues. Uh, this uh, is an amount which relates to an appointment that took place on the 20th of April 2018, and this is 17 million rands. Uh, the program manager certified an invoice for processing without verification of work done against this particular uh, service provider. And this is the acting CFO who's no longer in the organization. And that CFO left the organization. A while ago, we have started processes, we've opened cases with the uh, South African Police Service so that we can follow up on this case. And we also want to recover that amount, the amount of 17 million rents. Slide 16, Chairperson, is uh, also, payments not made within 30 days. This is 154 million rands. It's in relation to a service provider, Big in Africa, which uh, was not paid. The upfront payment 
which was in the contract in the contract uh, chairperson here, the organisation uh, didn't uh, meet the contractual obligations. We ended up in court and we lost the case, and uh, we also had to pay for interest. Uh, but we have taken uh, some measures to uh, to condone this. This is in relation to uh, a number of projects, Glen William, um, Olifants, and uh, those are the two main projects where Big and Africa was appointed and they took us to court. And again, the organization had some uh, financial challenges in that uh, financial year, 2018-2019. The person we get now into forensic overview, uh, and I'll give you the summary of outcomes of disciplinary actions. Between 2012 up to 2019, and we have accelerated this in the last uh, financial year, uh, up to this current financial year, you have 86 officials at level 1 to 12 that were found guilty, and you have 11 senior manager officials, 11 SMS members who were also found guilty. In total, we had 97 officials who were found guilty. And there were two SMS members who were not found guilty, and 14 SMS members who were found guilty. In total, 16 officials were not found guilty. And then you had nine SMS members who resigned. They were probably running away from something, or 15 officials who also resigned. I want to stress the point, Jefferson, that if you resign and there are criminal cases, we come after you. And that is why we have opened the 20 cases with the South African Police Service. In total, Chaperson, we have a, a case of about uh, 138 officials that were investigated. And only 24 plus the 16, uh, who res 16 who, 24 who resigned and 16 who were not found guilty. Slide 19. It gives you the same breakdown, but we're giving you now a, uh, a pie chart so that you get a sense of what we're dealing with. 97 officials were not found guilty, 16, sorry, were found guilty, and 16 were not found guilty, and 24 resigned. This is just a pie chart. Slide 20, Jefferson, is a breakdown of the sanctions uh, against those 97 officials. 39% re received final return warning. Uh, 18% received warning letters, uh, one demotion, 13 dismissals, um, which is 14%, and um, 15 days suspensions without pay. I need to stress the point that it's suspension without pay. Three months suspensions without pay, 11 of those, which constitute 11%, one month suspension without pay, and that's eight. 8% and two months suspension without pay. So this is just giving you a breakdown of the sanctions that uh, were leveled against the officials, the 97 officials who were found guilty. Chairperson slide 21 is uh, just giving you the summary of the outcomes. Again, here we have recovered 966,000. We haven't done much in terms of recovery because those processes, they take a little bit of time with uh, investigators in the South African Police Service. We also opened 20 criminal cases. Uh, Chairperson, we also have uh, conducted fraud prevention measures and we targeted 865 officials in the department. It's important for us to be proactive. We don't want to be to only deal with the problem when it has arrived. So we need to be a little bit more proactive so that when we Discipline you, which you shouldn't say that uh, you didn't know. Uh, Chairperson, you you also have investigations that have been uh, concluded uh, to the tune of about three billion rands, and uh, you also have uh, uh, work performed by the internal audit to prevent irregular expenditure. There's a new concept that the AG has introduced now, which is a preventative audit, that we need to audit these things before it's too late so that we can prevent a, a misconduct. On slide 22, Chair, just again to give you an idea, in 2019 of the completed forensic investigations, 38 of these have been concluded, 12 uh, in, uh, in progress. We have not started with the 15. We need an extra capacity to be able to deal with this, which is why Minister has appointed 
uh, additional capacity for us to be able to process these cases is one thing to investigate. It's another thing to process them so that we can execute consequence management. Uh, on slide 23, uh, it's a breakdown again of the forensic cases by account. On main account, we've got the figures there. Jefferson, you can read them. On the water trading entity account, these are the numbers. On slide 24, uh, we are also breaking it down, the forensic investigations that uh, are currently being uh, conducted uh, and those that still needs to be conducted, Jefferson. And this is a breakdown. The total is 35 of these uh, categories. Uh, on the on the left hand side, you can see the number. You've got fraud, you've got corruption, you've got conflict of interest, you've got procurement irregularities. On the right hand side, you've got the refuted ones, and you can see that there are few refuted cases, which means that we're doing very well in terms of the forensic cases. But we need to pick up the pace, which is why the minister has brought in additional capacity. This is a breakdown of the recommendations made by the internal audit monitors. We have to be proactive. We have to implement some of the recommendations. And they come back from 2015. And it, all what this begins to show is uh, the recommendations that were implemented uh, in 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018. Uh, you can see that there's been a regression in 2018, uh, 2019, in 2020, we didn't do well as well. Um, Jefferson, the next slide, which is slide 26, is consequence management. This is where all of these investigations and all the work around forensic investigations end up. Uh, you have to charge somebody, you have to fire somebody. So here, you have, we're just giving you an idea in terms of the employee relations, which is the work that is being done by uh, the labor relations component. It's done by the forensic unit, and it's also done by the stabilization team. And I'm hoping that minister will be able to talk to the stabilization team at the end, uh, if we still have time, because these are people who are assisting us to process the, uh, the, the cases and the forensic reports. On slide 28, Chairperson, uh, we're giving you just an idea of some of the cases that have been uh, investigated by ourselves and also by the SIU. Uh, you've got the Guiani project and the value there is 3.2 billion. And we have started the labor relations processes. The presiding officer has concluded on that one uh, and is awaiting for closing arguments from the from the parties. On the upgrading of the Tugela the trove scheme, uh, we have two employees uh, who are implicated, one employee has been served with a charge sheet and data of date of hearing to be determined. The other employee is uh, the charge sheet has been completed and will be issued to the employee as soon as uh, the lockdown has been relaxed. We were slowed down by the lockdown because the investigation has been concluded there. The value of that project is 477 million. Desalination project in Richards Bay, the value is 310. A million and the two employees were implicated there and one employee has to sell with the charge sheet and the charge sheet has been completed and will be issued to the other employee. I don't want to mention uh, the, the the names of the employees at this stage. The unlimited sub licenses, 285 million charges have been served and disciplinary hearing was set down to commence on the 26th of April it had to be postponed as a result of the lockdown. The security guarding services, 245 million. Corrective disciplinary steps were taken against the employees. And uh, the last one, Chairperson, is the financial advisory services, the 17 million. I have touched on it. Uh, this one is fraudulent, it is irregular, it is fruitless and wasteful. So both the, the law enforcement agencies, agencies are involved. We are also in court yeah, with this particular service provider, and we want to make sure that we recover that money. On slide 29, Chairperson, this is just to, to state some of the strategic interventions that the minister has initiated. I think I've touched on the stabilization committee, the advisory committee, 
and their job is to make sure that they assist us with the efficient and functioning of the water sector and assist us to stabilize the finances of the organization. And they will be looking at the various issues, supply chain, maladministration, uh, systems, they've already started their work. We have already ap appointed Advocate Thierry Mutau to assist us to lead the investigation within the sector. There is a significant amount of work that still needs to be done. We are also busy with the Lesotho Highlands Water Project Phase 2. We picked up some uh, uh, irregularities there. Uh, we are busy managing it. We are investigating it. We have asked National Treasury to assist us uh, to look at that project. It's in relation to the advanced infrastructure there. We have also discussed it with the AG and Treasury. Came back to us on Thursday with their findings and some of those findings are very material and we will be discussing it, those findings with our colleagues in Lesotho, both the Commission and also the LHDA, the company. Slide number four begins to talk to the water boards. Uh, Chairperson, you would have noticed that this is one space that the Minister has been focusing on over the last couple of months. In the area of Amatola Water, which is one of our water boards in Eastern Cape, we have appointed a service provider, Open Water, uh, Open Waters, to investigate maladministration there. We also want to make sure that we have a lifestyle audit as well, uh, and we need to do it across the board. The investigation is still in progress; it's not complete. Complete uh, in Liperle Northern Water investigations regarding uh, the chairperson was concluded. This one was not done by ourselves. I think it was done by SIU. And the end of our report was given uh, to the minister uh, in March 2019, not this minister, the previous minister, um, the office, let me put it that way. We have also appointed ORCA investigation pertaining to maladministration in the Bell and Northern Water. And the, we don't want to talk too much about this case because uh, the, the, the CEO of Lipel and Northern Water has taken a decision to put that investigation aside. So we don't want to comment too much about it because uh, the matter is subject care. Uh, the Special Investigations Unit of South Africa is investigating the Yani and other projects, and we will come back and list the number of proclamations and the status of those proclamations. Slide 32. Uh, Umgeni, the special, the special investigation unit, uh, will probably come to you and report on this. They are managing that process separate from us. We do get briefed. I met Advocate Mutibi last year in November, uh, and they do give us progress report on these things. But the, the work is still, it's still early days to talk about fin a final report. Mahalis, uh, we have an irregular expenditure there. This happened in prior years and investigations were conducted, and the board has to apply its mind on those investigations. So Dibang Water, this is one institution that myself and minister have put under a spotlight because financially they are grappling, they are struggling chapters in big time. In fact, uh, there are 18 municipalities that are going to be affected if that institution is failing to manage its uh, operations. In fact, this morning I was talking to the CEO and uh, the CEO made us aware that the municipalities have not paid Setiben Water for three months. Uh, and this uh, one municipality, Machabeng, owes Setiben Water more than three billion rands. And uh, currently, uh, issues of going concerned are going to be flagged by the, by the AG. So we need to get into that space and deal with all of these issues. Minister has assured us that an investigation has to be conducted about the fruitless expenditure and about the irregular expenditure in, uh, in City Bank. Blue Water, the value is not that big, but they have uh, 1.9 million irregular expenditure. And I'm told that the investigation was concluded and the board will apply its mind. Uh, uh, Treasury will condone it once consequence management has been Concluded. In Klatuze, uh, there is an investigation there. It's being conducted by the SIU, uh, and also you have issues of fruitless and wasteful expenditure there. Uh, in Klatuze, water is relatively financially stable. 
We're not worried about the finances of that institution, but we're worried about the misconducts. I think those misconducts are being investigated as we speak uh, by the SIU. Chairperson Ngoma to CMA, the allegations of irregularity in the matter was investigated by the department. Internal audit, it was found that there was no wrongdoing or irregular expenditure on the international travel. This was brought to our attention, but the international travel issue has been cleared. The preliminary investigations found that there was non-compliance on uh, the issue of uh, Lube Africa or Ferro um, uh, Property Limited by the Executive Corporate Services. That investigation is still underway, Chair. It has a lot to do with the SEM process uh, of this particular institution. It has not been concluded. On SIU, we have Proclamation 35, which talks to the allegations or uh, to the water board. We've touched on this, and that uh, investigation is still ongoing. Uh, it's been going on for some time now. I'm told it's very complex. Uh, there are issues that they, they are trying to finalize the uh, Advocate Motibi will be meeting with us soon uh, in order to brief the minister and myself on some of the work that they have done there. Proclamation 54, uh, we have touched on some of the investigations, including the SARPs, uh, licenses, the food and um, On Proclamation 22, it's the awarding of the LTE contract consulting by the Lipele, and this is the Guiani project. Uh, I don't know why we're mentioning the service provider here, but this is the Guiani project. Uh, SIU wanted to do what is called engineering audit. I'm told they have appointed a service provider to do exactly that engineering audit. We also have three reports. We have a report from MISA, there's a report from the department, and then there's a report from the AG. We will await for the SIU investigation report. And this is only intended to make sure that we can ascertain value for money. If a project is irregular, it means that value was realized, but if it's fruitless and wasteful, it means that value has not been realized. So all what the, the SIU is trying to do is to check uh, the engineering audit, whether there's value for money. We've already paid more than three billion rands on this project. <coughs> Proclamation 27, uh, Chairperson is about, by the way, Proclamation 22 also covers the Department of Human Settlements in Gauteng, but uh, they will come to you and report on this. What we have done in human settlements, we have handed over the findings because this part was concluded. We handed over the findings, SIU discussed that with human settlements, DG, and the findings were handed over to the, the DG, the acting, uh, the HOD in Gauteng, Department of Human Settlements for action. Proclamation 27 and uh, Proclamation 44 is the awarding of the contract by, the DV, by DWS to the SAP, what we call the SAP license. We've talked about it. We've started with consequence management. The, relate, the, the, the officials were implicated and been charged. We have also started the process of condoning uh, that amount. Proclamation 28 is uh, in relation to court de draw. Uh, SIU has not concluded this work, but from the side of the department, we have started the disciplinary measures. We think that we have enough information to act on the affected officials, especially on SCM matters. But SIU has a broader mandate than the department. So we have started consequence management in relation to this particular project. The person, uh, I don't want to go into details about all of these proclamations. You can read them at your own spare time. This is Proclamation 54 on slide 40. Uh, is Proclamation 22, which is about the Guiani project. On slide 41, uh, we're looking at current investigations, and that's Proclamation, on slide 42, sorry, is Proclamation 27 and Proclamation 44, which is about the SAP investigation. Um, slide 43, it's uh, Proclamation 28, uh, which is still underway, and this proclamation covers um, a number of areas, including the draw scheme, and it covers the, w, the WTE tender number WP0485, and it's also looking at project performance and expenditure. Uh, Chairperson, slide 44 is uh, 
Again, just a summary of some of the SIU investigations. I don't think I should bore you with all of that detail. And I'm sure SIU at some point will come and present to you. This is the work that they are doing. Uh, on slide 46, again, it's systematic recommendations from the SIU, what SIU has recommended to the department to avoid reoccurrence of the findings and all entities about to conduct business with the department must be registered on a formal supplier database. And this particular recommendation is already being implemented. And uh, uh, we've discussed it with National Treasury. Uh, so these are all recommendations about what we need to do to avoid the recurrence of some of the things that have happened. An amendment to tender evaluation documents should be signed off. Uh, slide 47. Again, it's systematic recommendations coming from our own investigations and the investigations that were done by uh, uh, by the SIU. And I will end there, Chairperson, and hand over to the Minister. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, DG. Uh, Minister, you had indicated that you would want to make remarks after, so we'll hand over to you now. I'm told the minister has stepped uh, out to attend to the NCCC meeting. She will come back to answer the questions relating to her. That's the message that I'm getting. Chat us. Right, that's fine. All right, colleagues, uh, I've got your list uh, here as we had agreed. Um, Right, let us, uh, all right. Honorable Dex, Honorable Van Minen, and Honorable Mente, we'll start with those three. Honorable Dex, over to you. Honorable Dex. All right, Honorable Van Minen, you can proceed. Thank you very much, Chair. I do have a couple of, or well, several questions here, if you'll be so kind. On slide 11, the fruitless and wasted expenditure, we have the numbers of referred cases. We don't have a quantum. Is it possible to find out what the quantum of those cases are? Because just to tell us how many they are is not particularly useful. On slide 15... We're talking about the material irregularity, payments made to a consultant firm. What consequence management has now been put into place to ensure that this is prevented in future? And how is validation of work done actually going to be essentially ensured so that we don't have a payment like this again? Because we now have 17 million that needs to, to be recouped. And this is an issue that went out in the first place. On slide 19, the summary of outcomes of disciplinary actions. This doesn't tell us what officials were guilty of. It doesn't tell us whether these are have criminal components. It's, it doesn't have any real um, meaning to it because we don't actually know what was being investigated here. I then want to... Move on to the strategic interventions on slide 29. I particularly want to pause on the Lesotho Water Project. And has there been any progress on the oversight, particularly with the cross-border oversight? I know that there were issues with that because we're dealing with South Africa and Lesotho, and I want to know if there's been any progress in that regard. Then when we get, this is going to be my final question, to Amatola Water on slide 31. Um, what concerns me with the Open Water Advanced Risk Solution is that the director there has ties with EWS, which is the company at the center of the allegations um, that the minister is allegedly facing regarding tenders with Amatola. Now, this this company has been appointed to this investigation. Is there not a huge conflict of interest? And if we could just please have some clarity on that. And that's all I've got for now. Thank you. Right. Honorable Dirk. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. You can hear me now? 
Yebo, yes, proceed. Yes, Chair, uh, thank you all for the report from, by the department. Although the report does not really give us any uh, solid details as uh, the previous speaker have, uh, have alluded to, uh, we are SCOPA and we need, we need actually the hard information and not a report that is uh, a report that was presented in this kind of manner. But I think the good thing that came out of the report is that at least it identifies the culprits. And uh, the report clearly states that where all this uh, unauthorized uh, expenditure and irregular expenditure are taking place is at the level of the implementing agents, which are identified as the, the water boards. Now, we cannot interrogate a department. We need those culprits who come to, to, to SOPA. We need the financials of those water boards, and we need to make them come and account to SOPA. We want to deal with these culprits. They must come and appear before SOPA, before SOPA because we can't interrogate the department. We want those water boards to come here. We want to see their financials. That's the first thing. The second thing that I want to raise is the issue about uh, on the slide 15. Where the DG is saying that no, uh, they are in court with this one um, service provider, but they can't mention the name of the service provider. If they, if the service provider, we are in court with the service provider, we want to know who are the, who is that service provider. That's the kind of information that we need as for We want to know who is that service provider. Then the report goes on and mentioning many, many officials, so many officials have been charged, so many have been suspended. But it does not really give us any details on who are the service providers that are implicated in, in all this uh, 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 wrongdoing. We want a list of all the service providers. What action um, are the department planning to take against these service providers? If no action, why are they not taking action? We need to know who are these service providers. And the ones that are already in court, that we are taking to court, we must be able to tell us, the department must tell us who are these service uh, uh, provider, providers. And then lastly is the issue about uh, uh, that, uh, that where the department is raising that um, uh, the, 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 the investigation unit is uh, looking for value for money, to see whether there was value for money in this contract. You see, for us as COPA, even if there was value for money in the contract, if a contract was irregular, we have a problem, we have a serious problem with it. So whether there was value for money, but money, but if that contract was irregular, we have a problem with it and we want explanations for, for, for it. So I think that basically that's what, what, what I want to say. That we want the water board to come and appear before SCOPA. We want to see their financials and we want to interrogate them. And we want the list of service providers that are implicated. Thank you, Chair. All right. Thanks, Honorable Dirk. So, Honorable Mente. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson, let me start off by saying I'm covered uh, by Honorable Dirk on uh, two questions on the water boards, but also on the water boards as implementing agencies. I I do not see other water boards that were listed by the SIU as well as the committee in the closing of the fifth administration, like the Krisani water board, and there's a water board in KZN as an implementing agency in KZN that's not included here. There were double payments that were done to those water boards, and we do not see the outcome of such um, investigations. Uh, on the issue of um, the funds to be condoned, I see we, you can be excited that you can now condone because there are consequences that have been undertaken and uh, some people fired and everything. You know, uh, DG, 
when you fire people and you you are not clear as to why you are firing them we don't find comfort in that i in particular i do not because there's so many transgressions in the water department with the with the water boards and its implementing agencies and everyone and if ever you are saying officials have been fired we may find that we have been firing administrators and everyone at the lowest level who have absolutely nothing to do with the tenders, with the DPA that did not meet quorum, with the double payments that have been done and people refusing to refund the department. So it will be good for the department to give us. And in fact, I was hoping that there is something missing from this presentation that we will be sent as to if you have fired men for what and which was how much so that we can make cross reference with people that got uh, got away with murder there's a tendency in departments across in South Africa of firing certain individuals and leaving certain individuals for same transgressions. And that should not be uh, the case. And I see on the report, on your recommendations, or rather your way forward, you are mentioning the services of... Um, I think advocate Terry Mutau. This name is coming for the second time in the department, a department that got into deeper problems with the services of the same uh, advocate. Now, what I want to find out from you is, what are the overlapping factors from what the SIU is doing and what he's going to be doing for the department? Or rather, what is it that he is going to be doing differently from what the SIU is doing for the department? And how much is that going to cost us? Because to seek extra legal experts to deal with the matters of the department when the SIU is fully capacitated to deal with such matters, we then run a risk of duplicating tasks and wastage, especially in your department where the funds are nowhere to be utilized carelessly like that. And if Terimuta had served in, in the water department before, what successes did he have that he must come back to conduct the very same investigations that you could not find in the department? And then the, la the last one, Chairperson, on the SIU, pity that we did not request the SIU to give us its side of the report in terms of finalized reports versus the reports of what the department is giving us. Because I was trying to access our last report of the SIU here and in terms of the numbers of this SIU report we've, we received uh, last on the last um, term, they are nowhere near the number of SIU reports and concluded by the department. There is some level of inconsistency in terms of finalization, and it does not give me comfort at all. So I think... Uh, when we are getting their report, which is expansiated in terms of detail, we should equally get the report of the SIU that indicating to us the areas where they have concluded their investigation and where the department has dealt with such culprits. Thank you very much. Okay, no, that's fine. We'll uh, be interacting with the SIU on these matters. We wanted to gauge the department's own efforts, so that is noted. All right, uh, Honorable Hattie with an H, and then Honorable List, Honorable Swartz, and then Honorable Tolasha, and then we will get responses and then get the second round of questions. Right. Th thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, 
let me welcome the presentation. I'm going to be in line with uh, previous colleagues in the sense that, Chair, I'm going to uh, compare and contrast the following slides, slide 8, 9, 10, and 11, with slide 18, 19, and 20. Um, on slide 8, 9, 10, and 11, Chair, we are given the root causes, the amount of money involved, the number of cases um, that were referred and completed, including condonation. Now, when you compare that with slide 18 and 19, we are given the outcome of, 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 of the DC, we are also given the number of officials involved and the sanction imposed. Now, Chair, I want to compare APOs with APOs. In Scopa, we're dealing with rents and cents and people and culprits involved. Chair, what the report is not telling us is that uh, out of these 11 senior managers and 86 uh, uh, officials from level 1 to 12 who were found guilty, who out of those officials were responsible for these root causes of 33% of implementing agents' irregularities worth 1.5 billion. I need to know that you, you, you need to give us a breakdown out of 11 of these officials that were guilty. One, two, and three were responsible for this 33% of irregularities of implementing agency. Five of them were responsible for this 22% of having uh, quotations that were not obtained. So we, we need to uh, attach culprits into different uh, 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 instances, Chair. That we're not getting. So I would like the, the DG to give us that detailed information so that we're able to check whether or not the sanction imposed is uh, 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 appropriate to the uh, 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 committed. But in this uh, fashion now, we're not getting the sense of, of, of that. The, the, the other thing, Chair, that we also need to get an understanding, this nine uh, billion that is going to be condoned, we, we need as well to get an understanding uh, uh, what sentence or, or sanction has been imposed, as well as those nine officials who resigned. At what stage of their cases did they resign? Did they resign before or after the guilty verdict? And what are the steps taken after them having resigned? Have we been able to pursue a, a civil litigation, open criminal cases? We need names of officials where cases have been completed. We need to know whether they are still within the payroll of the state those that have resigned, because we have a tendency of having officials who resign from one department and go to another department. So we need to follow these individuals and culprits so that we, 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 we effect a, a meaningful consequence management. That's the first issue, Chair, that I'd like to get clarity on. And I'm going to stop there for now. We, we'll follow on the later stage. But I think it's critical to be able to attach faces to the appropriate uh, 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 crime that was committed and whether or not the uh, uh, sentence imposed warrants. Because I have not seen anyone in, in, in this presentation, anyone being fired. Out of all these officials here, uh, we are told that 11 of them were found guilty. Uh, 32, between 11, 1 and 12 were given uh, uh, written warnings. What is strange and surprising that it's only six senior managers who were given final written warning, and two of them were suspended, and three of them were given warning. None out of these senior managers were, were given, uh, 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 were fired. So that uh, detailed evidence will assist us check in getting to a sense whether or not consequence management is being appropriately effected. Thank you. All right, now that's fine. Um, I'm advised that uh, the SIU is present and they are observing. I hope they are taking notes. 
in preparation for the meeting that we will have with them. So um, that is noted. All right, uh, Honorable Lewis. Um, I note that the minister is back. Uh, we will give an opportunity to uh, make uh, the remarks you wanted to make once uh, these, uh, uh, the, the colleagues are done. So, Honorable Liz, over to you. I've noted the other colleagues. Thank, in the Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, the world is facing the worst pandemic it has faced since 1918-1920. South Africa hasn't been exempted from this, and, um, and so we are in the middle of it. One of the key issues with dealing with this pandemic is the availability of water for all our people. Now, over the last decades, South Africans have been denied access to large, in large areas to water. At the outset of the pandemic, Minister Sisulu rushed out and said that water would be nationalized in the sense that the National Department of Water Affairs would be the coordinating provider of water and not municipalities. That's the way we understood it. And 17,000 odd water tanks were purchased. We're not sure what the process that was followed, but no doubt we'll go into that later. And these tanks were rushed around the country. Many, many, many of these tanks stand empty. The provision of water for these tanks is supposed to be done by the municipalities. The national department doesn't have the infrastructure. Can the minister please tell us how, what measures have been put in place to ensure that all these water tanks, plus the thousands and thousands of other water tanks that have been put in place over the years, are being put, filled with water and kept filled with water in order for our people who don't have the luxury of piped water to their homes to be able to fight the pandemic um, as is required by the regulations. Mr. Chairman, that's the first question. The second question, Mr. Chairman, um, deals with the Amatala Water Board, which has been dealt with to some extent. But I just want to ask for the minister to explain to us on what basis has open open water been appointed when there was already an appointment of outsourced risk and compliance assessment? Why is a second service provider being appointed to conduct an investigation into Amatala? And how was, what was the process that was followed to make that appointment? Mr. Chairman, my, my last question is somewhat parochial. Um, I'd like the minister please to, to explain to me. She replied to a written parliamentary question regarding the Spionkop bulk water project. This project forms part of the problems that face the South Africans who don't get supplied with potable water. This project has been on the go for at least eight years, but probably longer in the background. In 2018, we were assured that this project would be started and completed by 2019. This project is a project to supply potable water to the whole Utogela district of KZN. So people who live, have lived for generations and decades in Burford, in Driefontein, in, in Ndaka, down at, at Oitfal, right up into the mountains at Kwadlamini and Zarke Lindau. This project is supposed to supply them with water. Right now, the project hasn't even started and eight years have gone by. But the question to the minister is, in March, she replies to my question, written question, to say to me that the project is only in the feasibility stages. 
And the feasibility study is going to take two years. This is a project that's been in the in, uh, finalized. I mean, the design's done. I've been working with engineers for nearly 10 years um, in my capacity as a local pu public representative. Now suddenly the minister is saying, no, it's in a feasibility study. How can that be? What's happened about all the money that's already been spent on engineers and designs and public participation, environmental impact assessment? This project should have been finished, Mr. Chair, and the water should be going to our people who need it now to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. But the project hasn't even started. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're muted, Mr. Chairman. Oh, uh, Honorable Tolasha. All right, Honorable Swartz, we can proceed. Mum Tolasha will get here now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, my questions, my first question is on page seven, um, slide, slide number seven, uh, the irregular expenditure. Who are the people involved in the transgressions? Were they disciplined? How many were fired? Were there loss of public? How many police cases were opened? How much was recovered? And lastly, how are you going to ensure there is no repeat of such transgressions again? On page eight and nine, Chair, on the graph there, on both graphs, where you have the least percentage on the graph of expenditure, that's where the department has used huge sums of money on both page eight and nine. On the graph, on the one, you've got 2%. But of that 2% on the failure to disclose money is used for other purposes without approval. On both pages, Chair, it is the hugest amount. And um, on the graph, yes, it seems little. Uh, in, in terms of funds used for other purposes without approval, it's huge sums. Of if we can also get a, an explanation as to what type of measures they have in place, Especially on page nine, payment of consultants without proof of work. How do you pay before checking if you have received the goods you ordered? What is your procedures for payments? How are you going to litigate on this irregularity? And then on page 13, unauthorized, how does the department use money that they do not have does the department not have procedures for such challenges uh, your planning trends do they not serve to guide you regarding under budgeting understanding avoiding overspending how do you plan to ensure you don't exp expose the department to such a Chair on page 12 when the dg reached condemnations he did not speak to these items which could have given us more clarity. Also noting that most of the uh, condonations cover almost all the major services of the department. I am pleased kindly requesting that they give us a separate report uh, detailing to us so that we can understand because um, the DG did not uh, give a, a lot of clarity on the condonations on, on page 44. The DG used the language that it does, does not want to bore us with the SIU proclamation. Now, on that slide, if the DG knew it does not want to bore us and it's not important, why did he include that slide? Because that slide has got financial implications and, and, and therefore it is with the SIU. So I am just asking why does the DG say it does not want to then did he put the slide there because it's part of his own 
representation to us, which have got financial implications. And to this ASIU proclamations, you are also talking huge sums of money, Chair. I will stop there, Chair. If we have a second round, I will request uh, to speak again. Thank you. No, no problem. You will. Um, I, I do know that there are colleagues from other committees. Uh, there was um, a discussion with the House Chairperson. So we will ordinarily start with members of the, the primary member of the committee, and then we will come to those colleagues. So I will request that they um, just be patient. I have noted them. Uh, Honorable uh, Somyo. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Chaperson. Um, I, I, I think in, in appreciation of the of the report, um, as as the as my whip has indicated, uh, Honourable Dax, that uh, there is an indication that at least something is now uh, moving towards uh, the finalisation of the matters uh, which are viewed as um, of a legacy uh, issues. Uh, and that indication, uh, that that indication would uh, value uh, the fact that some detail uh, ought to be provided um, by the by the DG um, in, in terms of assisting us on on further areas. Uh, for example, uh, where where there is a reference uh, uh, of the uh, investigations which are taking place. Uh, and 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 they begin to um, uh, indicate to us which of those uh, investigations have reached uh, the climax uh, in terms of those uh, court proceedings. I've 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 seen uh, the reference uh, on some uh, which which are are not necessarily providing uh, a detail on. Uh, those who are involved in terms of those uh, uh, court uh, proceedings. It, it could be a good thing that uh, uh, the committee should have that uh, uh, on, on, on record. The second thing is um, this thing that relates to overall in terms of the summation in as far as the introduction is concerned, because the department might continue uh, to incur unbearable costs. Uh, there are matters of policy which uh, ought the department to adhere to or to follow uh, in, some, in some instances. For example, if you are looking into uh, the areas that uh, relate to um, enhanced industrialization um, in, the, in the country, and, uh, one of the uh, instances which are very crucial uh, is the localization principle and, and uh, the effect thereof um, which might come heavily uh, on the department in as far as the exchange uh, rate is concerned in terms of the foreign uh, currencies, uh, which could uh, then be a result uh, of a, an expense which is going to be heavy, unintended to the organization by making use of a, a, a foreign uh, related uh, products. That, 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 that's something which uh, uh, I think we could as well appreciate uh, as the committee going forward. Uh, I, I could say this uh, in respect of this uh, uh, report, but it is uh, one of the areas which I think um, uh, we need indeed to uh, look into in as far as the expenditure is concerned. The last area, uh, Chair, uh, is, is looking into um, two areas. One is on the security Guard services, where there is an indication of a corrective uh, disciplinary uh, action. Uh, what sort of such, in terms of the explanation, uh, maybe the DG would have to uh, deal with. And the other one is on the Guiani um, uh, 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 investigations. Uh, there is no indication there as to how many are the officials involved in terms of the billions uh, of rands which actually. Uh, under investigation, though on others there is an indication of a number. Uh, so uh, such kind of a detail which is lost, uh, I'm sure it will be 
appreciated that we are preferred with it uh, by the uh, director general. Otherwise, um, I, I would really uh, appreciate the fact that there is an indication that the department seeks to address these legacy related matters uh, which have been bedeviling the Department of Water Affairs over a period of time. Thank you very much, Chair. All right, thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, I will ask that uh, we move to Honorable Nkala, Honorable Power, and Honorable Lubengo. And then we will hand over to the department. All right, Honorable Muslala. Um, thanks so much, uh, Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much. Uh, I had a preamble, but I can see that time is against us. So I'm just going to shoot straight to the question. My first question is going to go to the issue of the war on leak program. The question is, from 2015 to 2019, over 3 billion was spent on training, but there's little to show for, exp for expenditure. EW CETA must still explain how it spent 2 billion on trainers and venues and how it assured value of the qualifications provided. Has the EWC provided information to the department or to the investigation, investigation under consideration? Furthermore, if there had been more attention paid to stopping leaks and less in giving business to friends, a great deal of money would have been saved and young people would have had the opportunity to do useful work. The department, EWCTA, and implementing agents were complicit in ensuring that over three billion was spent on this program. A student did not emerge with a formalized qualification after this. How do you rectify this? and explain this when the ideology of the developmental state caters for creation of jobs, opportunities, poverty, eradication, and equity. As a result of the war on leaks problem, pro, program, over 20% 20, 20 of the department's annual budget of 16 billion was diverted for its intended purposes. This severely disrupted many critical regulatory activities Critically, revenue from water sales were paid to Transkeleton Tunnel Authority, which is responsible for meeting the loan commitment on large infrastructure projects such as Lesotho Highland Water Project. Linked to the above was another failed project, the Drop a Block Project, in which the department distributed over a million plastic blocks at a cost of 161 million. The question is, who benefited from providing a million extremely overpriced plastic blocks? How were they selected? Date, the information has not yet revealed. We can provide more detail on the project as well. With regards to the, to the budget eradication program, my question is, um, a 2015 investigation showed how Bloom Water, on instruction of the department, appointed a well-connected political company. Has, still ca has this case finally been concluded, whereby the, the company Babereki took the department to Bloom and Bloom to court? Despite the expenditure of hundreds of millions spent on this program, many households Still, no, st still have no alternative but to use baguettes. Yet, large contracts were arbitrarily allocated to companies which were taken from water supply projects to find the never-ending bucket eradication project. I'm going to touch on irregular uh, expenditure. Uh, the question is, uh, procurement through deviations from the supply chain management regulations was highly prevalent at implementing agents in the past years, as some of the supply chain management practices was to treat directly from the legislative requirements and therefore due to the multi nature of this project, the department is still incurring the irregular expenditure. 
Furthermore, the entities' irregular expenditures were mainly due to deviations which were not justifiable and did not meet the definition of an emergency procurement. The question is, as part of its oversight function, does the Department of Water and Sanitation not provide guidelines to entities undertaking work? On this, on on the on its behalf, on processes to be followed in respect of deviation. Does the department not have a definition of an emergency procurement, which could be effectively utilized across all institutions within the entire water value chain? What oversight does the department internal audit committee undertake over the entities that are issued with directives? At this systematic monitoring and evaluation. Then the other question is under irregular under irregular ex expenditure. The total balance of irregular expenditure amounted to seven billion for the 2018-19 financial year. Could the department provide more details on progress on the following deviations, which are currently under uh, investigation? We have, we have AECOM South Africa on 148 million. We have Beacon Africa 15 million. We have Bicacon 12 million. Ingerop South Africa 12 million. North Coast Water in, U, Utility 6 million. An amount of 64 million for other services such as rent, maintenance, security services, and travel and accommodation. But Topo Management Services. An amount of 94 million in a respect for teacher. Alterum solution, 18 million. Problem. I'm about to finish. Because yeah. as indicate, we will still have a hearing on all these matters substantively. Please let you round up. If you can please round up. Okay. So there's another project of uh, the SEP project. Uh, the SEP project related to the department's decision to spend a huge amount of money buying an IT system for organization that did not need it. And without asking them first, the department entered into a five-year contract worth 950 million for software services from the German uh, FAP company. So the SIU informed Parliament that it will initiate civil litigation in the first quarter of 2019 in the report of the President of the first March. But there's no information taken against those responsible. Does the department have a copy of the SIU, SIU report and what action has been taken and how much was recovered? From the step. the last one, uh, Chairperson, I'm, yes, I'm reading up. Come back in the next round, please. I'll ask okay. you to come back Thank in the next round because Thank we've you. got other topics we still need to ask. Honorable Powell. Hi, Chairperson. Thanks for having me. Um, my questions are directed at the Honorable Minister. Um, I see she is on the conversation. On page 29 of the DG's presentation, um, it notes that an advisory committee on the stabilization and efficient functioning of the water sector has been appointed to look into, amongst other things and other matters, um, investigations into maladministration. Now, my understanding is that um, these advisory committees are section 76.1 um, appointments in terms of the Water Services Act, meaning that the members of these advisory committees uh, are appointed at the sole discretion of the minister and then obviously signed off by the DG and the deputy ministers. Now, our colleague, um, Becky Hadebi, rightfully noted that um, we should have the names of those persons have been embroiled in corruption within the department because often we see the civil servants are redeployed to other departments and entities once they resign having been embroiled in maladministration and corruption. Um, the same though could be said of those people appointed to serve on advisory committees. So for instance, uh, yesterday the minister confirmed to me in a parliamentary question 
that um, she's appointed ex-minister Susan Chibangu, uh, who resigned from parliament just last year, to sit on this uh, stabilization advisory committee, which will oversee investigations into maladministration in the, in the Department of Water and Sanitation. I'd like to ask how the minister justifies this appointment, because surely giving members the role of conducting, amongst other tasks, um, investigations into maladministration requires specific skill sets and um, experience. I'd also like to understand who else sits on this advisory committee and whether or not they have the right qualifications and experience to be conducting things like investigations into maladministration. Um, a chairperson, my second question is for the Director General. I'd like to know, or well, the Acting Director General, um, I'd like to know if, if he would be able to give us in this meeting a list of all of the entities in both of the departments um, of, of water and sanitation and human settlements. And, and if you can't speak to human settlements, that's fine. Water and sanitation will do for now. But basically, I'd like to know how many of the boards have got interim boards currently and how many um, of the entities have got acting chief executives. Because we cannot fix this department and what has historically gone wrong in this department without employing secure boards who've got the authority and the teeth to really act. And my last question um, is, is for the Honorable Minister Susulu. I'd like some clarity. I have now asked this in two emails and in our portfolio committee of water and sanitation. So I really am hoping that I do get an answer today. Um, on the 2nd of May, the minister advised um, the, the public via a media statement that she had ended the term of the interim Amatola Water Board, and then obviously Orca was appointed and Open Water Risk um, Advanced Solutions was appointed. That question's been asked. But, but the board also released communications noting that they had accepted the minister's decision and that they'd stepped aside. Now, just yesterday, the minister released a new media statement um, speaking to the issues at Amatola and Lapeli Northern Water Board. And in this media statement, the, the minister noted um, that the, the board of Amatola, the interim board of Amatola, remains in place. So now in the space of a month, we've had two different communications from the ministry, one saying the term of the interim board has been, the, the board's been disbanded, and then yesterday saying that the board remains in place. So please, can we have clarity as to what happened with those media statements and, and what is currently happening with those boards? And then to the same end, my last question would be, um, the media statement spoke to the issues at Lapeli Northern Water Board, um, I'd like to understand whether or not the CEO of Lapeli Northern Water Board, Phineas Lahori, as per the minister's previous statements, has indeed been suspended or placed on precautionary suspension. Thank you very much, Chair. Right, thank you, uh, DG. On the question of persons who are acting, you will confine yourself to water and sanitation. Uh, uh, in that regard, on that question. I know colleagues are asking me why I'm in the dark. Well, we've been experiencing load shedding in this part of the world for the past week during this time. So, yeah. Honorable Lubengo and Honorable Tolash, and then you get responses, please. Thank you, Chairperson. On the issue of outcomes of disciplinary action, this case has taken too long, Chairperson. We do not want this to happen again. So my question is, can the department explain to us on, on what internal controls are in place to ensure that such irregularities do not recur? Thank you, Chairperson. All right, thank you. Honorable Tolasha, you'll have the last one. Ma'am Tolasha. Yes, uh, Toby, please contact to Mam Tolash as soon as you find her. You will indicate to me. I know that uh, she does have uh, network difficulties in her area, so it could be that we have lost her. Right. We will hand over to the department and the ministry to uh, give us responses to the questions. I'm sure that they will be able to 
compartmentalize them uh, accordingly. Uh, DG, on the matter of the service provider with which whom you are in court, I want to stress that um, since you are in court, we do need to, we would like to know who that service provider is. Um, so if you can actually um, speak to that. Uh, on the issue of uh, advocate term Dow, can we be given the a, 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 a summary of uh, an executive summary, which is going to indicate the terms of reference of uh, what he's expected to do. What are the cost implications of uh, this investigation and so far as how much they uh, are actually going to be charging um, the, the state. Um, I do want to, uh, is to stress that um, we are dealing here with a department that uh, has not covered itself in any glory in so far as financial management is concerned. Um, and precisely the reason why we would have actually by now, had it not been for the lockdown, commenced with the uh, completion of the parliamentary investigation that the fifth parliament had began, that we can bring all these matters to a logical, legal and parliamentary conclusion. So having said that, the purposes of today is also to make sure um, that we are fully briefed in so far as what the department is doing and satisfy ourselves uh, if whether we are happy with that and where there are shortcomings, we will then make a determination as a committee as to whether we proceed uh, with uh, that investigation or we will give space and time uh, to those, uh, to, to what is actually underway. So I think it becomes important, therefore, in that regard, that um, we, we, we fully we, we get the answers. And that's why DG was quite skeptical sometimes of the scantiness of, of the explanations and boring us with details. But colleagues, I think we will also uh, have to interact with the SIU and the other law enforcement agencies in so far as uh, where these cases are, because it must not escape us that uh, we are not happy with the slow pace of the investigations on one hand, but the prosecutions have been moving at a snail pace. And I think that the law enforcement agencies do need to satisfy us uh, fully that they have got their uh, act together. It, 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 it just does not augur well in that regard. Finally, uh, DG, um, we would like you to prepare a, a, the breakdown of where these people are that have left the department. I think that cannot be overstressed because we are dealing here with persons who are behaving in a manner where once it gets too hot in the kitchen, they leave only to go and enter another kitchen and then continue with their misdemeanors. So for so long as we've got this, you know, a vicious cycle of people moving from one department to another, we're not going to actually uh, successfully deal with the corruption and mismanagement. I'm told that uh, is back and then we will uh, actually uh, uh, proceed and I, that in the event that because when these uh, load sharedings in our area happen, the network goes. Um, colleagues, um, we will, I will, will make alternative means for me to remain in the meeting. So please just be on standby to assist in that regard. Right, um, Mam Dolash? I see her screen, I see she's here. Um, Mam Dolash, can you unmute? All right, Minister, can I hand over to you? We'll come back to Mamutola. Chairperson, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Minister. You can proceed. Thank you very much, Chairperson. I, I will uh, answer some of the questions here that um, um, I, f I find very important. Um, what uh, pertinent to attend to. 
And uh, if you will allow me after that, I think there are about uh, six or seven of them, I will then return to Cabinet because we are still proceeding with uh, putting out the regulations. I've had to excuse myself to come here. That's First fine. of all... Explain uh, because there was a question why pardon? the minister... No, if I may explain why yeah. the minister was in two meetings at, at one time. Mm -hmm. We had initially scheduled the meeting for 12 o'clock at which the minister was available. Because of the limited space on Parliament's platform, we were moved to three, and that is why then she's towing and throwing between the two meetings. I just thought I should put that there, that it was a matter on our side. The minister was available fully for 12 till three. So that's why then she's in between the two meetings. Right, Minister, you can proceed. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Chairperson, I need to uh, foreground this uh, whole discussion around the fact that uh, we have been in this department all of about now eight months. And I must say to you that I am very proud of the work that has been done by the department. As you continuously have said, we inherited a department that was not exactly, uh, you know, covered in glory. We've had to dig into that, understand where we are, and actually turn this around. I was uh, listening in when the Auditor General came to give a report to uh, the Portfolio Committee, and he's insisted that their biggest concern is lack of consequence management in the way that we run the affairs of the state. And so we wanted to show you that we do have consequence management in this particular department in the shortest possible time. I have heard uh, members going on about how long things have taken and all of those things. Uh, we would like to say to you, we've picked up on what we have, and this is where we are. And I am, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very glad, I'm very proud of what has, has happened. That is why we were actually offering to come and show you what we have done. Uh, and uh, this is why we are here. Uh, there is a question that uh, was asked uh, about, um, um, I think I'll start from the end, is asked by Honorable Powell uh, about the Stabilization Committee and indicating something about Susan Shabangu. I want to say to Honorable Powell, Susan Shabangu has more experience, more, more understanding of politics, more understanding of government than you could ever have. Susan Shabangu has been part of this government from 1994. She became a, a, a minister in 1998. Before that, she was a, a secretary general of a trade union movement, national trade union movement. She's a trade union activist by profession. She's a woman uh, gender uh, activist by profession, and she has served this government in various uh, capacities. She has the necessary experience, and that is why I took her. The fact that she is not in parliament is uh, very similar to the fact that uh, Helen Zilla is not in parliament. We might easily say the same thing about her or any other member of the DA who's not in parliament. That question does not hold. Susan Shabangu has the necessary experience, especially in labor law, and that is why she was brought into the stabilization uh, team, and I'm very proud of the work that she has put in. Then there was a question about um, why is it um, that uh, we have appointed uh, two, uh, two firms to audit the, the two entities? Uh, the two, actually, there will be, finally, there will be three entities that we will be auditing. OCA is an auditing firm that has worked for us. It has worked in Libelle for a number of uh, um, months now. And um, it had gone back to Libelle after it had had its, it had uh, audited the work of the, of Amatole. It went back to, um, uh, the auditor went back to uh, Libelle. Um, there is absolutely nothing stopping me choosing anybody to do, go and do auditing or do a forensics investigation. The second team, the second person who was sent down there is a forensics investigator. The one is an auditor, the other one is a forensics uh, investigator with very specific reasons why we wanted to do that. The matters will be going to court as you have been told 
and we wouldn't like to have anything that is subjudicate discussed here. But that is the reason why. Why did we choose open water? Open water is on the database of, uh, um, of Treasury. Right now, it has served, in the past, it has served at the Treasury in Gauteng. It has served the National Department of Transport. It has served the National uh, Northwest Treasury. It has served DECO. It has served the Eastern Cape Education. It is on the database. And it has proved itself uh, to be a very reliable invest, uh, forensic investigator. And that is why we chose uh, that particular open water entity. Um, why are the different uh, agencies overseeing uh, the, the, the uh, agencies uh, or boards? It is because they have two different responsibilities. Um, what are the... What is outstanding about Terry Mutau? I am surprised that members of parliament should ask that. He has a trailblazing, very good record. We will put it on the website. We will give it website and we will give it to all of the members of parliament so that they know why we chose him. He has had outstanding results and we are expecting that he'll have outstanding results with us as well. Um, the other question was, um, how was uh, open water uh, uh, appointed? Uh, section 45.2 of the Water Services Act 